the problem of obesity in Estonia was highlighted through the National Health Plan Evaluation Report in 2014, and therefore the Ministry of Social Affairs started to prepare the Green Paper of Nutrition and Physical Activity. The Green Paper is a dialogue, policy dialogue paper with the aim to formulate the problem, to offer solutions, how to solve the problem, and to agree on the goal, what we want to achieve. But it's not obligatory to implement the policy options concluded in the Green Paper. Nonetheless, it contains proposals for the government what they should do to solve the obesity situation. At the same time, Estonia was also a member of WHO Evidence Informed Policy Network. And in the beginning of EvipNet Europe in 2012, there were different processes already going on in Estonia to support the evidence informed policy. We had the Health Technology Assessment Center, uh, Clinical Guidelines Development Committee, and all our legislative and policy proposals have to cover the impact of the change, reasoning why something needs to be done, and evidence what the change will imp that the change will improve the situation. And as we didn't know what is the tangible result of creating the knowledge translation platform that EVIPNET promotes, it was decided that we will develop an evidence brief for policy that can demonstrate us the benefits. And the topic for the EVP was selected from the government's program that focused on energy drinks, and that was later changed to sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, I will come back to the details of the change later during my presentation. But why is the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages a problem? Uh, the mechanism why it leads to weight gain is its li liquid form. The consumption of sugar sweetened beverages is not often not counted as a meal, and therefore people tend to overconsume their ca daily calories intake. They can be addictive. Uh, sugar stimulates dopamine release, and that gives a sense of reward and reinforces further consumption. And therefore, once the habit of consuming the sugar sweetened beverage is formed, it may be difficult to break it. And also the association between the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and weight gain is found to be stronger than that for any other food or beverage. And sugar sweetened beverages consumption is associated with development of obesity related chronic metabolic diseases such as metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and also with cardio cardiovascular diseases and certain types of cancer, and also with poor oral health in adolescents. About the situation seriousness in Estonia, every second adult and one third of children in Estonia are overweight or obese, and the situation is worsening fast, especially among children. On the graph, on the on the downside of the slide, you can see that in 2004, nearly 43% of people in Estonia were overweight or obese. But in 2016, the proportion of overweight or obese people was already 9% higher. And also the new cases of diseases that are associated with sugar sweetened beverages consumption are increasing in Estonia. Like you can see on the graph on the top of the slide, the diagnosed obesity and type 2 diabetes and also children's oral health isn't good. Here you can see the timeline of the activities that were done. First, the problem of obesity came to attention through the National Health, uh, National health Plan uh, Performance Review, as I already mentioned previously. Then we started to develop the Green Paper on Nutrition and Physical Activity. And in September 2015, we started to develop the Evidence Brief for Policy on the topic of reducing the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and their negative health impact in Estonia. We had discussions about its content among different stakeholders, and we also made a proposal for the government what to do next. And this is something that the evidence brief for policy doesn't contain, but it's necessary in order to move things further. Our proposal for the government was that all of the policy options that we observed in the evidence brief for policy complement each other and should therefore be implemented together in order to achieve the best possible results in health. The government decided 
that we will integrate the policy options in the green paper of nutrition and physical activity and implement later in a later stage. But after the change of the government, some of the proposals moved further more quickly, namely the sugar sweetened beverages tax. The Parliament approved the tax law in June 2017, but the President rejected it and sent it back to the Parliament for further improvements, and now it's back under the discussion in the Parliament. But there have been other developments as well related to the policy options that were proposed on the evidence brief for policy. Our National Institute for Health De Development has done awareness raising campaigns about sugars and their negative health impact. The school-based intervention is integrated into the country's public health act and it's uh, obligatory for the schools in the future to ban the sell, uh, sell, selling of products that are high in salt, sugar or fat in the premises of the school. The change of the law is not approved yet, but the draft has been sent out for consultation. And together with the industry, we have started to make a self-regulatory guide about advertising restrictions to children about foods and beverages high with fat, sugar or salt. And we know that the self-regulatory approach is not ideal, but this is how we will start with uh, dealing with this problem and in the future we can go over to obligatory measures if the self-regulatory measure doesn't work. And now to the top 10 lessons that we learned during the process. Lesson one, the evidence brief for policy gave us a solid background and we could rely on it as it's based on systematic reviews that are all assessed according to their quality and reliability. It is a high quality product as it has a beer and merit review processes. It has its own methodology, how it's done, and therefore it's more objective than the former ways how we have supported policymaking in Estonia. The department's role uh, where I work uh, in Ministry of Social Affairs is to support knowledge-based policy and therefore we conduct studies, give advice about best practices, and also evaluate the impact of policy options as it's obligatory in Estonia to assess every law or regulation impact before it's implemented and also often after the implementation in, in, in order to do adjustments if it's necessary. And there are instructions how we should do this kind of pre and after assessments, but there isn't any concrete methodology how it should be done. It can be based on individual studies and we don't have to indicate who the how the search strategy was done, uh, how the studies were found, and whether they were evaluated or not according to their quality. Therefore, the evidence brief for policy has a much stronger footing as it was very transparent how it was conducted. Also, the evidence brief for policy is written in non-expert language and is adopted to selected stakeholders group. And therefore, it should be understandable to all of the relevant stakeholders as it's written in policymakers' language, uh, it, tar it's target it targeted them and raised their interest more than the previous ways how we have done the studies, uh, study reports. About lesson two, uh, offer multiple policy options that politicians and implementers can choose from. Uh, in the end, it's up to decision makers whether they will act and implement something or not. And in order to ensure decision making flexibility, multiple policy option is the key. Only one policy option might not lead to decision making, as things might change during the process, like political changes, and you would still want the problem to be solved. In our case, uh, the government changed during the development of the evidence brief for policy, and therefore the four options that we, there were four options that they could choose from. And after the change, some of the options moved quicker, namely the sugar sweetened beverages tax, and other more slowly, but the uh, discussion still went on. Lesson three, the problem definition. I would recommend to link it with a priority topic in health policy. We selected the topic for the evidence brief for policy from the government's program 
and the form, how it was phrased in the program, can be seen on the top of the slide. In a later stage, the topic itself was widened from energy drinks to sugar-sweetened beverages, as the real problem that the government wanted to solve was the increasing prevalence of obesity and overweight. On the bottom part of the slide, you can see how it's framed in the current revised government's program. When you don't find direct link, I would recommend you find something, some other thing, how you can frame it, like the problem, frame the problem through how it improves economy or decreases inequality, something that will raise the interest among policymakers. And I also think that the problem definition should be specific, the formulation of the problem. What I mean is that uh, try to narrow down the problem in order to get to decision making. Don't try to solve all of the problems in a country with one evidence brief for policy. Sometimes it might be something that you exactly want to do, but I believe that there are problem formulations that will feel fit more uh, in the current situation than others. And now to the four, uh, fourth lesson that is closely connected to the last one that I talked about. In order to formulate the problem in a way that it will move further until the implementation of a policy option or policy options, you need to engage with stakeholders. It's critical to do so in the problem formulation stage. In this stage, it's important to engage all relevant stakeholders, but in our case, it was also important to engage with politicians in order to frame the problem in suitable way. It doesn't mean that I have to do the lobbying work because I do want to ensure my objectivity and credibility, but I need to know what is the problem that addresses them the most, but also ensures the desired goal. Stakeholder engagement is important also later throughout all of the process. Like when you formulate the policy options, they can be a great help in identifying the policy option barriers and opportunities. We presented the results of the evidence brief for policy widely and had discussions among different stakeholders. We had, had discussions inside the Ministry of Social Affairs, among working group for the Green Paper. The working group consists of representatives from NGOs, industry, involved ministries and WHO, as well as researchers, physicians and public health specialists. We also had discussions among secretary generals from other ministries and state secretary and also in the cabinet of ministers as we selected the topic from government's program. We also communicated uh, the uh, results through media and Ministry of Social Affairs blog. And there was also a public debate on the national television that allowed stakeholders to participate and state their opinions. And in order to know who you need to engage, how, who and how you need to engage with different take stakeholders, map them and their interest. Know who are the ones who are with you and the ones who will fight against you and try to think through how to address the ones who are against you. But it's also important to know how and who to uh, engage and empower the ones who you might benefit from. In our case, uh, I would say that we forgot to do the mapping exercise and learned its importance in the hard way, as the industry was against us. And as we didn't uh, think uh, through strategies how to lessen their influence, and therefore some of the politicians, nutritionists, lawyers, and even physicians went unknowingly along with their manipulations. It's also important to think about who are the stakeholders who are there, wh whose probability to be there throughout all of the process is higher. The top level policymakers will stay for a short period of time because their appointment is political. As such, it's important also to target the mid level policymakers because they are the engine of policymaking. They stay longest in the system and they can be more easily reached. In our case, uh, we engaged not only with ministers, but also, also state secretary and secretary generals from other ministries. And I think that this was a wise move as the government changed during the process, but people in those positions stayed. 
Lesson five, the evidence brief for policy alone is not enough. The local context and local evidence is the key, how you can ensure decision-making and policy implementation. First, uh, you have to sell the problem to policymakers, and usually the way to do it is to show the size of the problem in your country, and not only from the health side, but also from economical perspective. At least in Estonia, the way how to sell the problem is to say how much does this problem cost for the country and how much we can save when we solve this kind of problem. And policymakers also need information about local situation. It addresses them uh, more than only global knowledge. So there might be need to conduct uh, several studies. We did uh, the WHO Childhood Surveillance Initiative study where we rated all of the first grade students in Estonia in order to know the obesity situation among them. We also had previously conducted nutrition survey and made a market survey to know the content of sugars in the sugar sweetened beverages that are sold in Estonia. When politicians got to the policy options selection part, they also wanted to know what countries have implemented those policy options, what have been the impact, and how long does it take to see the results? How does the policy option influence? Who does the policy options uh, influence the most? You, and you have to be able to provide it, and the sooner you prepare it, the better it is. We had a separate mapping study when we all already went to the government to make the proposals. And when the policy option of taxing the sugar sweetened beverages was selected, there was also the need to know what would be the health outcomes for different tax rates so that they can decide what tax rate to implement. And therefore, the Australian Cancer Council, with the leading of Dr. Lennart Wehrmann, conducted a modeling study that was supported by the WHO Regional Office for Europe to show what are the possible uh, results of different tax rates. And it was extremely useful exercise. As I previously told, uh, it's important to map the stakeholders who are with you and the ones who are against you. And specific to the evidence brief for policy topic that we did, the industry is the one who is against you. And they will try to do whatever they can to suffocate the topic and to ruin every chance that you have to get to the implementation part. At least in our case, it was like that. And they even said publicly that, the, that they will fight uh, against us till the last drop of their blood. So they were very emotional about the topic. Throughout the process, uh, they leaked false claims. First, they write a panic strategy. They uh, were saying that the government wants to tax all foods that have sugar in them. Later, they changed it and told that the prices of local food products will increase more than the imported ones. Uh, they also said that the European Union law doesn't allow taxes on sugars or beverages. They also claimed that Finland plans to abolish its so-called soda tax as it doesn't work and has uh, failed elsewhere either. Uh, who doesn't know then Finland is the neighbor country for Estonia and we always look up to them. Uh, then they also frightened public by saying that the sugar in the sugar sweetened beverages tax uh, beverages will be substituted with sugar substitutes, and these are even more worse with, for your health. And they also said that overweight and obesity in Estonia is mainly resulted in low physical activity and not because we consume too much calories, even though the National Nutrition Survey said the opposite. They also conducted their own study to show how the sugar sweetened beverages tax will harm Estonia's economy and labor market, how many workplaces will be lost, and how the unemployment rate will increase. And they even organized a seminar against food taxes in Estonia, where they had their colleagues around the European Union to talk about how tax measures hasn't worked anywhere else. Lesson seven, don't forget media. We didn't have a plan to communicate the message throughout the media, but as one of the industry's weapons to suffocate our efforts was also to do it through media, we had to react. As the public's opinion is important, 
and can also shape the opinion of decision makers. But be aware that the media can be double-edged as they might formulate the problem in a wrong way and they might reflect the topic in non-scientific way. What I mean is that they might make false claims and they are selective whom messages and how they want to communicate. The aim for them is to sell the paper and conflicts and scaring people are the strategies that will sell better. But when you need them, then create a communication strategy before you go out with the evidence brief for policy. In case the topic is something where the public's opinion is needed and you want to shape it, and be aware that there is a rule in media that the one who speaks first tells the truth. They message will echo throughout the process, so make sure that you are the one who is speaking first. It's very difficult to say otherwise in the later stage. And when you need media, communicate the message clearly and broadly. In our case, we used uh, Facebook, Ministry of Social Affairs blog, TV and radio programs, online and paper journals, and other kind of communication ways. Lesson eight is also, of course, the committee team, which is essential. Uh, for us, uh, it was important that the country team would have members with different backgrounds. Uh, we wanted some of them to be from policy side. We had three members from Ministry of Social Affairs. We wanted some to be from implementation side. So we had a member from National Institute for Health Development. And we also wanted someone from research side. So we had a member from University of Tartu. But we also wanted uh, the members to have different uh, expertise. We wanted them to be content experts and the others to be methodology experts. And in our case, we didn't have access to databases and we didn't have expertise in assessing the systematic reviews. And therefore, the Evipne Chile, namely the Dr. Pantoja and Mansilla, helped us with that. It's also important to know your roles in the team, who is doing what uh, during and also after the development of the evidence brief for policy, in order for the member to know what are their responsibility and what is expected from them. It's especially important after the evidence brief for policy is discussed, at least in small countries where we have only few people uh, with content expertise, and in our case, we had a team where all the relevant stakeholders were included. And I think that this led to more used evidence brief for policy as all of the members had the feeling of ownership and therefore they wanted the things to work out. Lesson nine, acknowledge translation activities should be sustainable. Uh, the evidence brief for policy and its later activities clearly showed us that there is a need to have more sustainable structure, how the knowledge translation is supported in Estonia, especially in the field of public health. As in healthcare, there are a lot of supporting structures already in place, like the Health Technology Assessment Center and Clinical Guidelines Committee. Uh, we also learned that doing things together in equal and continuous collaborations helped to fill the gap between policymakers and researchers. It helped us to understand each other better and to speak in the same language. And therefore, we will conduct a situation analysis in order to map what processes in today's knowledge translation in Estonia works and what are the barriers in today's situation. And in order to fill those gaps uh, we, uh, that we have today's uh, situation, and when we are ready with the situation analysis, we can start the discussion how to bring policymakers and researchers more closely together in order to support the evidence informed policymaking in Estonia in a new level. Last but not least, the lesson 10. You are not in control of everything. But from such knowledge translation activities like the evidence brief for policy and policy dialogues, we, en we can engage with policymakers and researchers and direct the decisions to be at least evidence informed. 
when not evidence-based. But we also have to accept and recognize the tendency of policymakers to base their judgments on their well-established beliefs and shortcuts based on their emotions and, and familiarity with information. Evidence is one of the different factors that influences policymaking, but there are others like the cultures, culture, political context, expertise, policy narratives and res available re resources that will also influence the final outcome. So don't be harsh with yourself when things don't go in the way that you intended them to go. As the final decision to implement the policy option is not is up to politicians, but we should be there to shape their judgments and support them to make the best decisions for the citizens. Here are some of the references for those of who you are more interested about Estonian experience or to know more about uh, the um, uh, about fiscal policy measures. So. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was an excellent, uh, an excellent presentation, excellent overview, and some great insights on that whole uh, process. I'll uh, just turn it over to Kaelin now for some reflections from the forum perspective and some of his insights, and then we'll get to a Q and A session. So, if anybody has any questions they want to share, please use the chat box on the bottom right hand of your screen to ask questions in there, and then we'll get to that in a few minutes. Thanks, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine, Kalen. Great. No background noise? Nope. Good. Okay, thanks a lot, Christina. It's a pleasure hearing this for, I think, probably my third time. Um, the first time I heard it was uh, last summer uh, in Slovakia where you gave this presentation uh, without the slides. So, you know, I was hanging on your every word then and I was hanging on your every word now. And the good thing is that we've seen the story evolve over the last six or so months. and New challenges have been highlighted and new insights from Estonia uh, keep coming out about how we use these types of efforts in specific uh, reference to evidence briefs for policy to try and push forward evidence informed change and system strengthening. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. I found that uh, a great, 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 great story to follow. The biggest advantage of the way Christina presented uh, today, which is quite different from a lot of the other presentations we've had thus far in the series is just the focus on all of the potential political challenges that are uh, wrapped up in this in this process and i think i want to focus more on that discussion here because we have lots of resources out there about how we approach the development of evidence which christina mentioned some of them including the need for a strong team and uh, being systematic and transparent so it's no secret that we completely agree with everything she said in that regard but what we don't tend to talk about a lot is the politics. We acknowledge them often and very clearly, but what we don't talk about is how you overcome some of the big challenges that exist. And as Christina mentioned at the end of her talk, I think it's sometimes you have to just uh, hope for the best. You can't control everything and you have to be okay with that when you're engaging in the policy process. Uh, but there's a couple of key things that I wanted to point out. So there are four big potential political issues that emerge. They're not all challenges, but they're just things that I think we should all be aware of when we're pursuing evidence based for policy. So the first one that she mentioned right off the bat was taking advantage of windows of opportunity. And I think that the this is very, very important. And it's not always the case that people who are engaged in knowledge translation and specifically with system strengthening and developing evidence briefs to inform system strengthening efforts are aware of this. So oftentimes it's a pet project or an issue that someone's really interested in rather than what the policy context is telling you is important to decision makers. So great uh, examples from Christina about how there was active movement and it clear signals that the issue of obesity was on the governmental agenda uh, and there were politics aligning with this with the development of the Green Paper, et cetera. So it was the ideal opportunity to develop an evidence-informed policy brief to, to, uh, to push this forward. So I think that that for me is a big, a big important point that she made. It's not always possible, however, to, to do this. And one of the things I think uh, that is important for anyone who's developing these briefs to consider is in the event that it's not necessarily the top government priority, efforts need to be made to be both a, a savvy political analyst so that you can actively watch in real time uh, how the politics are shifting, how the framing of problems are shifting so that you can jump on those opportunities should they emerge 
Uh, and also when you're actually writing the documents and pulling the evidence together, figuring out ways that you can organize the narrative and frame the problem in ways that get traction. So it's not always the case that you can actively uh, influence what's happening at the level of government, but you can certainly do things uh, as uh, knowledge brokers, as people involved in um, EBITNET type efforts to push things forward. So the solution for me in that case would be, uh, despite not always being possible, you need to know how to frame issues and you need to know how to analyze and, and watch the politics as they emerge in real time. The second big thing that Christina mentioned that struck me was the uh, importance of engaging. So I, I know you mentioned that it's really important to engage stakeholders, but one of the big barriers I think that you mentioned, uh, there were two. So one was industry, and the second was that the president didn't, didn't seem to be completely aligned with the the, the approach that was proposed uh, after the brief was developed and you know essentially put a veto on uh, a law that was passed in parliament. So. I think that for me, that's you know a really great example of the need to not only map and engage, but I identify ways and mechanisms to overcome potential differences uh, and to get everyone on the same page. So I'm not sure, and Christina can answer this in a second, whether or not the brief that was developed informed the stakeholder dialogue. But as many people know who are on this uh, this webinar, that the forum oftentimes does develop a brief in isolation of a stakeholder dialogue. Uh, it's not an end in and of itself. It's actually an input into a stakeholder dialogue where we 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 systematically uh, engage a range of policymakers and stakeholders, both who will be involved in decisions about the issue, but also those who might be affected by the issue. So this would include groups like you know politicians and and industry. And the whole point behind this is to get everyone in a room, put the evidence in front of them, and have it out. So really discuss the key challenges that folks are facing with option one versus option three. And this way it gets everyone you know, it, it, on the same page and could hold some folks to account. So if there are false claims being made within the process uh, by industry, if you have the evidence in front of you and it's taken as read and you have a stakeholder dialogue where people feel open that they can discuss their, their concerns based on their own experiences, tacit knowledge, et cetera, then it's more likely that folks like politicians might see the benefits of actually moving forward with some of the options proposed specifically if the brief contradicts with rigorous, systematic and transparently collected evidence what industry or other interest groups are saying. So for me, the political roadblocks from industry and others who may not be completely informed, a way around that would be to develop a stakeholder dialogue uh, process and, and, and actively pursue that. The one downside to that, of course, is that it takes a lot more planning, a lot more um, team effort, as Christina mentioned in, the, I think, number eight of her lessons learned. And so it's not always feasible, but definitely, definitely, definitely something to consider if you're going to develop a brief figure out ways to engage folks uh, around the brief. Another big piece that Christina brought up that I, I felt wasn't you know, explicitly discussed, but uh, at least implicitly, the false messaging falling on uh, public uh, ears in a way that may misrepresent the issue. And uh, you said the media fed into this, but there was also kind of a campaign by industry. And so it's, it's often the case that at the end of the day, politicians and those uh, elected to seats have to make decisions based on what the public's perception is or else they won't of course get voted in the next election. So uh, it's not a, a full solution of course, but one of the approaches that we've uh, taken to try and overcome some of this engagement of the public in evidence informed ways is to develop citizen panels. So we take our evidence briefs, we develop them into citizen briefs which are much more uh, easy to read and the streamlined versions of the evidence brief. Uh, but the idea there is that we engage 14 to 16 citizens with lived experience with the issue. They have the evidence in front of them, they weigh in, and then we take those insights and we work them into the brief. So that serves two purposes. One, it can inform politicians and others who might read the brief with what the public really thinks about it once they're informed. So, you know, I think that's a huge benefit to anyone making decisions at the, at the level of systems. Uh, and it also, you know, engages citizens and gives them an opportunity to voice their concerns uh, at that point in time. So it's not only empowering citizens, but also empowering policymakers and stakeholders to make decisions based on um, systematically and transparently elicited values from citizens. So again, my roadblock at the level of the public, the overcoming that would be uh, looking for ways to engage uh, citizens uh, with lived experience to weigh in on the issue and feeding that to policymakers. Finally, the last big kind of issue and challenge politically that Christina mentioned was uh, the need to establish uh, your role as unbiased. And I think this is a challenge for many people that are dealing uh, in this world and that are act actively working towards supporting the use of evidence and policymaking. Uh, the challenge that we 
often come up with is why do we not conclude with recommendations? Uh, and Christina very succinctly put it that she didn't want to be seen as an advocate. And we believe that to be a very, very important uh, piece of the puzzle on our end as well. So uh, despite the fact that people may be asking for recommendations and asking you to weigh in on your preferred option, um, I think Christina has it right. You want to be viewed as unbiased. You want to be um, also seen as kind of a support for the process rather than someone who's taking one side or another. And a way to do this, of course, as Christina mentioned, is to be systematic and transparent with your approaches, being viewed as uh, approaching the situation with the rigorous uh, methods uh, and methods that can be easily reported back to people should they ask. Um, and this is also beneficial if you want to continue to do these types of things in the future. If you're seen on one issue as taking one side, the likelihood of you surviving a change in government or surviving as issues change and, and go on the agenda and off the agenda is very low if you're seen as being biased. So I, I'd really just like to echo Christina's point there about the importance of trying to do what you can to be seen as a, an unbiased part of the process at supporting the use of evidence rather than making explicit recommendations based on that evidence. And so the solution here for anyone on, on this webinar is unfortunately to make some tough decisions about where you're staking your, um, sticking your flag in the ground and where you're drawing the line in the sand. And for us at the forum, it's making the tough decision to not conclude with recommendations in our briefs and not um, aiming for consensus at our dialogues. And we have very clear rationale for doing both of these. So for the recommendations piece, of course, it, it forces us to you know, put our own spin or maybe our own values or our own um, insights into a decision about which option we prefer. And that's clearly not our role. Uh, and at the, at the end of the uh, dialogue, not aiming for consensus, very clear that if we push for consensus, again, our, 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 the view of us as an unbiased broker might be uh, tarnished. And on the other hand, if you have a bunch of policymakers representing a number of different constituency, constituencies in the room and industry, the likelihood of them being able to hang their hat on a particular option in that room on that day is very low. Uh, likely has to, uh, issues like this have to go back to boardrooms and, and, uh, and other you know, groups that make the decision at the organization. So uh, it just isn't really a practical uh, and feasible uh, thing for people to make decisions uh, on the day of a dialogue. And that's one of the reasons we don't aim for consensus and dialogues as well. So I think that these four big things are, are you know, really important uh, issues. And I'm glad Christina brought them up. And I hope that some of the solutions I propose that we use to approach them uh, are helpful for those on the, on the line as well. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to mention is the role of media. And I think that it's an open conversation. This is probably the second or third time I've mentioned it in these webinars about the importance of engaging media. Uh, at the forum, we haven't really done this uh, as routinely as we probably should have uh, traditionally, um, but internationally, I think it's a, it's a nice flag to say that this is being realized by those supporting the use of evidence and policy, uh, and there are active um, groups that are trying to push forward uh, the more kind of sustained engagement of media in these processes. So not only do they understand where folks like Christina and Evitnet are coming from, but most importantly, what it all means and, and how they can be responsible in what they're putting uh, out there. So I know that in this, uh, in this world, in this climate of fake news, um, there are lots of different ways that these things might be spun. But, you know, the, the most important thing I, I believe is, is the engagement piece. So if anyone's interested in what types of efforts are being done around the world, um, you don't really need to look for, uh, further than the health systems global uh, media fellows that have uh, recently been established. It's a really interesting initiative where um, in the lead up to the big uh, biannual conference called um, the Global Symposium on Health Systems Research, the Health Systems Global Group who oversees that conference has now um, established, I believe it's six media fellows who are actively uh, engaging in, in the work of using evidence and actively engaging in how that evidence can inform system strengthening efforts. So uh, those are my main kind of insights and takeaways from this. But again, I'd just like to take my hat off to Christina for doing such great work in Estonia, pushing forward things uh, so well and uh, being such an advocate for evidence informed policymaking. Uh, and so thanks again, Christina. Thank you, Kaylin. Yes, thanks, Kaylin, for uh, for that uh, discussion. Uh, there's a few questions that have come through, so I'll just uh, maybe dive right into that. 
Um, it seems like there's uh, a lot of interest in the discussion that uh, Christina brought up and Kaylin alluded to about the role of industry. So um, one person commented that it was very important uh, to learn about the strategies that uh, the industry used to um, kind of try and combat the efforts that uh, you were undertaking, Christina, um, because they, their comment was that it also happened in Slovenia, and I'm sure that's certainly not an isolated case. Um, and somebody else also asked a question about how you manage the industry's efforts. Um, did you engage with them? Did you invite them to the dialogue? Um, or any other efforts along those lines? Yeah, we did. Industry was also uh, present in there when we discussed uh, what kind of policy options to implement. And also when we were selecting what kind of tax rate there should be on the sugar sweetened beverage, so they could say what they want to say, but uh, we don't have to like always listen to them and do exactly what they want. So we did engage them a lot. But on the other hand, um, there is a question for me at least all the time that whether we should engage them at all. In certain industries, like in the tobacco industry, usually you don't uh, don't ask the tobacco industry to come and talk about the topics, how to solve the topics. So I think that this is something that every country is doing differently. We usually do engage industry, alcohol industry, also tobacco and and food industry. But it's a good question whether you actually engage with them in very deeply or not. And there's actually a question that is sort of a bit of the, the flip side of that is that, uh, you know, commenting that if the sugar and sugar beverages industry interests are very powerful, then what about the nutrition products industry? Um, now, I know some of those companies have a bit of a mixed interest, but uh, some of them certainly have simple interest in terms of you know health and reducing obesity as well so was there you know industry interests on the opposite side that you engaged with as well the, the NGO actually is food industry NGO we don't have a separate sugar sweetened beverage NGOs so the food industry NGO itself was the pre was present in the in the meetings uh, but uh, yeah okay great um, and I think this uh, the question might be a little bit more for Kaylin, though certainly, Christina, you're welcome to comment as well. But uh, it was asking just about the role of advocacy in the adoption of policy options uh, and after the policy dialogue and whether advocating for the evidence informed policies would be considered as taking sides. So I guess the idea, I know what Kaylin mentioned about, you know, you don't want to be um, positioning yourself as, you know, taking one side or the other, but I guess if your approach is more advocacy, advocating for the evidence-informed uh, result, whether that is the same or if there's sort of a, a balance to be struck in there. I'll briefly weigh in, but I think Christina, given her recent experience uh, with the roadblocks and kind of having to navigate the political quite a complicated political uh, landscape might be something that she can weigh in on as well about how to remain uh, as that unbiased advocate for evidence and foreign policy rather than an advocate for a specific uh, approach because clearly the evidence uh, is you know shows that uh, the policy that was proposed uh, is the right way to go so uh, my own view about this is kind of from our experience at the forum that we're very clear that our role is to support the use of evidence. So I wouldn't necessarily call it advocacy, but I would absolutely say we're champions of evidence-informed health system strengthening efforts. So whether you want to view that as advocacy or not, I think um, you know it could be lumped into either category. Uh, but we're shameless about our our promotion of that approach to the use of evidence. There's lots of evidence out there, and a lot of it can help us make better informed decisions about health systems. So you know, we're doing things actively to try and up, up policymakers' game in, in that uh, realm. So I, I guess I'm an advocate for it. I guess at the end of the day, we, we do promote that. Um, but I think it's different than taking sides in a particular policy issue uh, with respect to options that you're pursuing. So uh, it's a bit of a complicated question. Um, and I think it's also issue specific. Sometimes the evidence is so overwhelming, it just takes a little bit of time to get people aware of what the evidence is. And then you're seen as less like an advocate and more like a, 
you know, a, a traditional knowledge broker who's just trying to uh, help people make better decisions. On the other hand, if the issue is rather contentious and polarizing uh, and the evidence falls on one side rather than another, it could be the case that you see more like an advocate specifically if the evidence points in a direction that doesn't align with other stakeholders. So um, complicated stuff, but I, I do believe that we are uh, champions of evidence informed policy. Again, if you want to call that advocacy, then uh, I think it's, it could be warranted, but uh, I, I hesitate to use the word myself. So I'll pass it over to Christina and, and you know, give us some more tangible uh, experience with whether you were viewed as an advocate at any point in time. Well, it is a very difficult topic itself, but uh, we try to do it in a way that we would just say what the evidence says, but we don't want to make any judgments like what to do or what not to do. So, yeah, we just advocated the evidence itself. So, Great. Okay. Um, and just as a reminder, if anybody has any additional questions, please use the chat box to ask them now. Um, I also wanted to just ask, I know that uh, a number of countries have um, either brought about or have attempted to bring in, uh, you know, soda tax or other sort of similar policies to help uh, combat obesity, uh, Mexico being the one example. Um, when you were working to develop your evidence brief and looking to, you know, I guess move things forward in Estonia, did you look to see what other countries had done? And if so, you know, how did that sort of shape your, your process and, uh, and outcomes? Yes, of course, because policymakers and politicians also wanted to know what countries have implemented already the sugar sweetened beverage tax. So we had overview of the countries who have done that already. Uh, then they also wanted to know uh, what have been the results. I know that in, Hung in Hungary they have uh, evaluated the results and also in Mexico they have evaluated the results. So those were very uh, useful for materials for us. And also when we wanted to agree on the level of the tax rate, what kind of sugar content and what kind of tax rate we should put there, uh, we also uh, also looked uh, into the, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. And then we also looked uh, into the UK's example, what kind of tax rate did they put there? So it's very, very important and useful to use other countries' experiences. And what we also did was that in Finland, they already have the tax. And when we uh, wanted to uh, frame the uh, tax rate and to do the law, uh, the draft law, we also used the Finnish uh, law draft, uh, tra the draft of the Finnish law. So we translated it into Estonian and uh, took some things out of out from there that we could use in Estonia as well. Great. Uh, and so I know you mentioned that the soda tax itself was, uh, you know, was pushed back and is sort of being It's Yeah, it's still in the in the parliament. They are still discussing it. Uh, the, the president, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, she was against the law, but she was against some of the exceptions that there was a, was exception for the airlines and ship companies in the law that she does, didn't like. But per se, she she was really okay with the with the draft law itself. Right. So it's yeah, back in the parliament, and they are renewing the uh, the the tax law. Well, that's great to hear that the discussions are ongoing and that there's still you know a lot of support for it. Uh, we had one other question about um, the option you mentioned about school policies and whether that part was adopted and if there was any uh, barriers, I guess, that were unique to that uh, policy option that were identified. Mm, about the, uh, yeah, the school-based intervention, the ban of selling uh, certain products in the schools. Well, uh, we uh, put it in our Public Health Act. It's a draft of the act uh, right now, and it's out, of, out in the consultation. So it's not obligatory yet, but we want to do it obligatory for the schools uh, to ban certain product cells. But we don't say exactly what kind of products. We give them a guideline what they can use, but they themselves will select what kind of products they will ban in the schools. Great. That's excellent. I, I don't see any other questions coming in, but I'd just like to give this uh, opportunity, uh, Christina and Kaylin, if you have any sort of last uh, last comments or anything that you want to share. Well, I, 
I would just like to say that uh, I think it's extremely important uh, to share and learn from each other's experience. So I'm very grateful that the McMaster Health Forum facilitates this kind of change. So thank you, Keelan and Stephen. Thank you, Christina. I had one question, and this is maybe something you thought about, but um, was there any kind of internal um, discussion about whether or not this would inform a more kind of formalized stakeholder dialogue uh, process? And given all of the additional things that I know that go into that, uh, it's just interesting to know where your team is at with thinking about that process and whether or not you think that might be able to help you overcome some of the challenges that you encountered or not? We haven't planned anything, but actually I think that this is comes this comes up when we are doing the situation analysis, because I have put together the team who is doing that, and I think that we can cover uh, the experience that we have had during the, the development of the evidence brief for policy also inside the situation analysis. And also I have uh, talked with our media department about how do you maybe in the future, how do you avoid certain mistakes that we did this time. So we, yeah, we have had kind of some, some sort of discussions inside the ministry. Great, and another question I have for you, Christina, is whether or not the, you know, success despite the fact that the president essentially sent you back to the drawing board, um, do, you, do you get the sense that given the traction that this one brief got in Estonia, and is likely to continue to have as you know policies are revised in parliament and whatnot um, do you feel as though you've set a standard that people look towards and that you know you'll be asked to engage in similar processes for different issues in the future uh, yes of course actually the the exercise that we did with the evidence brief for policy it certainly raised the demand to have this kind of products but not only the evidence brief for policy, but also the modeling studies and, you know, all of this kind of uh, things to know even more detail than to be like a normal one part of the normal policy process. That's great. And so I know that in Ontario, our home province here, we have a group uh, in something called the Research Analysis and Evaluation Branch, and they actually have a rapid response unit um, inside the ministry where they they field questions and put together evidence briefs uh, on short notice for folks within the ministry itself. So it could be the case that you're, you find yourself in that similar situation going forward. And it's great to know that, um, yeah, as more evidence informed policy is made, there's more demand for evidence informed policy. So that's something we're seeing everywhere, actually. So it's great. Excellent. Well, just before we wrap things up, there is one other quick question that has just come in. So for Christina. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, there's some changes made to the Public Health Act and other things, but uh, the question was whether any changes were made in the healthcare system regarding services for obese children and their families. Uh, we are actually with the uh, nutrition and physical activity green paper with what we are doing. We are also renewing all of the other things in the system, so there hasn't been anything done yet. But, but this is something that we really want to do in the future, yes. Okay, that's great. Well, I'd just like to take this opportunity to, again, thank you, Christina and Kaylin, for being part of this webinar. It was a very interesting discussion and really interesting to hear your insights and uh, learn a bit more about the, the real leadership role you're taking on not only this issue, but advancing uh, evidence-informed policy making in Estonia and certainly setting a, a high standard for other countries in that region. Mm -hmm.